which has been the subject of a recent gramophone recording that we made. It's a piece called... Uh, and it may be a bit meaningless unless you understand the English idiomatic, but it is nevertheless, and will remain thick as a brick. It, it probably came about primarily because the thing that we'd done the year before, which was the Aqualung album, um, had generally been perceived as a concept album, whereas to me it was just a bunch of songs, as I've always said. And um, so the first thing about Thick as a Brick was, let's come up with something which is um, um, the mother of all concept albums. In the case of Thick as a Brick, it just started off from a one line you know, which just made itself into, I mean, I just kept writing until I had a lot of music. I mean, if it's a sort of, if it has to be a terribly conscious effort to do something different for the sake of being different, well, that's wrong. But as long as we're lucky enough to keep, you know, naturally coming up with something which feels different, has a different, uh, different set of experiences behind it, different, uh, perhaps different intellectual concept behind it, then that's fine. So long as it comes naturally, it's something born out of a year's being older. I saw it as, as moving on from Aqualung, but once I'd heard it in its entirety and then seen it performed, yes, it was, a, it's, it's a, it's a fine piece of progressive rock music. Essentially, we, we did that album from beginning to end on two reels of tape. Uh, it, it, it was recorded as it was conceived. And maybe that's why it's called a concept album. I, I don't know. You had the visual of what actually went on, who played what, where, when. And of course, Ian at the front, whether he's playing his guitar, at which at this point in, I've no need to advertise Ian's skill as a guitarist. I mean, it's remarkable. I, I just think we, we, we felt that we wanted to do what we wanted to do. We we're going to see where music took us, but that, that there was no agenda. And you know, we, we, we didn't want to be uh, top of the album sales. That wasn't our priority. Our priority was to be a better band, play better music. Thank goodness, it's different from I don't know. Name anybody. You look at the melody maker charts and who was in it and what they were doing, and you think, well, what a poor lot of stuff there was about, and it was all Tin Pan Alley stuff. <laughs> of music, a lot of music to remember and, and complicated music as well, um, but it, it works incredibly well. Personally I can't remember ever playing it note perfect from beginning to end, but that was the challenge. <laughs> Right in the middle of the music, the telephone would ring, obviously on tape over the PA. Ian would stop the music in the most ridiculous place, and it would be a phone call for Mike Nelson. 
<laughs> oh, really? I don't yeah. remember that. Even and though it happened every night for five the years. Yeah. And then kind of a, a couple of minutes later, this roadie who, who hated doing it because it had to wear this wetsuit oh, yeah. and aqualung right, yeah. and face mask. Of course, yeah. it'd be sort of 90 degrees in the gig anyway. Mm-hmm. And he'd be sort of pouring <laughs> buckets of sweat in this suit. And unfortunately, he'd been volunteered to be Mike Nelson. And he would just wander on the stage, flippers and all, and take the phone call. It, it's just, it was just silly. It was, quite deliberately, but in, in a nice way, tongue-in-cheek, and meant to send up ourselves, the music critics and the audience, perhaps, but not necessarily in that order. Perhaps it was, at that point, the beginning of um, people getting away from going on stage and playing in jeans and uh, t-shirts which had had tended to have been the way things were. Suddenly there was something that was a little more theatrical and organized. Alice Cooper at the time was was you know chopping his head off in a guillotine on stage every night whereas you know my approach was a little more gentle with um, rather elegant tights and a natty cod piece. painter section comes in at the right time. You know, Ian's, Ian's the master of, of mood and atmosphere. Can't say any more, really. I mean, it's, it might sound as if I'm being paid to, to, uh, to, to, for Ian to get in the charts. He doesn't need me barking away about his gifts. When you are singing what you really feel and singing from your own standpoint rather than make it black and white when it, it can be very trite you know you tend to sort of make it a little bit uh, you know a little bit hazy a little bit uh, a little bit abstract and, and very um uh, you know very subjective in the way you put it across you've got two extremes something very silly and something very serious but it works because you had that balance <laughs> or concepts expressed in the music mm. or in the lyrics uh, is that it's, it's everyone's right and the necessity, I think, uh, should be apparent for everyone to decide, you know, to make their own judgment on things in their own way, regardless of age or experience or even intelligence. You know, I mean, mm. we have at one end of the, of the scale of... Uh, uh, intellectual society we have people who are necessarily making judgments on people at the other end of, of the scale you know who may be as the, as the word suggests thick as a brick I mean your wise men don't know how it feels to be thick as a brick you know so how, how the hell can they decide for the man in the street thing about 
thick as a brick is that we all had a showcase, you know, whether it was Jeffrey talking, guitar solo, a flute solo, a, a, a keyboard part, uh, a, a drum section. <clears throat> it, it was the, the variety was all in that seed in that album, uh, and, and we all had a, a, a little time within the within the album to come to the front. is a brick, like the Albert Hall performances, fans will have taken away out of that auditorium that night what they'd seen as well as what they'd heard. And they were able then to kind of join the dots to see who put it all together. And of course at the back there's, there's Barry, you know, doing his thing. And it's like all of the Jethro Tull music in that decade namely 1970 to 1980, which was my time with the band, starting in 1968. It was the, the mould was, was cast, the die was cast. <laughs> I believe there's a certain amount of theatricality that's grown up. There is an act, a Jethro Tull act as such. Is this well, something that just know, happens or it's something that's planned? There are a lot of things in there, but I wouldn't say they were an act. They're, they're all, they all began as really improvised things. So they weren't actually thought out, formalised, uh, theatrical, you know, attempts at combining media or anything like that. The band got its biggest boost in confidence at the time when, when Jeffrey uh, was wholeheartedly in the band, around the, the making of Thick as a Brick, and Barry was also in the group. Throughout that, the Thick as a Brick sort of year, um, it, it was a, a very confident time because the group sort of had a, a great sense of identity. We really felt very different to all the other groups that were around. And it was at that point in time that the, the so-called sort of underground groups of the, the late 60s, early 70s had given way to the progressive groups of the, of the, of the early to mid 70s. What do you do when the hours come? Do you want to be here? Do you want to be here? It was a period in, in, in rock music where everybody was taking themselves too seriously and, and, and we as a band just found it ludicrous that, that people would sort of stomp on stage and sort of tight velvet pants and uh, uh, the rest. It, it was all so pompous and, and stupid. So we were sort of taking the mickey out of them via ourselves. So we, we were saying, well, we know we're playing serious music, but, but you know, it's entertainment and uh, we're just musicians, uh, you know, we're not rock stars, we're trying to play great music, um, but we're having fun doing it. And I think the audience warmed to the fact that it was very different, that we were giving them something a lot more than the music on its own. We, we were making it a very visual uh, experience as, as well as an audio one, um, and, and nobody had done it before, so the humour was there, the sort of Monty Python-esque humour, uh, and we we just took it to the, any extreme we possibly could.
do it basically for me, you know, which is the most honest reason I can have for doing it. I don't have to make compromises to people that way, except to some extent the other guys in the group, just as they would make to me, but that's within the, the unit that produces the music. John had had a lot to do with it, and John Evans, that is. John had been playing the piano since he was about four or five or something, you know. He knew an awful lot more about music than he was prepared to admit. And I think that his input into Thick as a Brick, it was, it's the, the derivations of some of the stuff, and certainly with Passion Play, which, um, it's very difficult to see where the seams are, the joining up bits of Ian and John Evan. We, we love being on the road, we love playing music live, and, and that was the way we were able to do it. But, but we, we never set ourselves that those um, those things that we needed to attain. I think it, it wouldn't have worked that way, you know, it wouldn't have been so natural because we were taking big risks by the stage show. People might have really rejected what we did as being just, you know, unrock and roll. I'm sure that John's input was was considerable, as it was with many things, with the, with um, the music of Jethro Tull. Thick as a Brick and Passion Play mm. were involved in the process of uh, arranging the music, actually making it into its finished form, mm. and therefore it was a very uh, intense sort of equality that existed in the group at that time. In a way I'm passing the buck and saying don't blame me if you yes. don't like those two records because they were very much all the members of the group sort of involved yeah. as well. Brick, as we've already mentioned, is a concept album containing one continuous piece of music packaged in one of the most elaborate sleeves ever. The whole thing unfolds into a very convincing satirical imitation of an English small town newspaper, which includes reports of the literary achievements of an eight year old local prodigy named Gerald Bostock. And he turns up on the label of the record as co author of the lyrics. We asked Ian to explain. Oh, well, yeah, he's the, he's the little figure that I'm sort of saying is me as a little lad, you know, who sort of was supposed to really, you know, had everything going for him, you know, really quite precocious little lad, very bright, very clever, and, you know, read books and knew a lot of things at an early age, but sort of uh, well into opting out of that and, and making his own way, you know. Uh, I mean, a sort of exaggerated version of me as a similarly aged child. My, my main reason for going into it was just to, uh, really for fun, for fun and the fact that I was... Uh, not a particularly uh, welcome member of the family at the time I disappeared from it temporarily. And to be a rock and roll star at the age of about, well, about 18, actually. Yeah. Yeah. About 18. But I lived off my uh, ailing father for a couple of years, which he didn't appreciate very much, <laughs> you see, after I fled for them. And uh, I don't know, you know, he thought I was really going to miss out on everything. 
but he really likes me now, you know. <laughs> he really likes me, he thinks I'm a good bloke. Maybe rather foolishly, we, we had a, a finite period of time to record all of this, I mean to write, rehearse and record all of it, and foolishly I think we booked a rehearsal studio and the recording studio a couple of weeks later, so everything just had to go to a timetable. usually with me waking up in the morning in North London having about maybe two or three hours to feverishly attempt to write some music by late morning where I would jump in a cab or on the tube or whatever and rush down to the the Rolling Stones rehearsal studio in Bermondsey I think it was where um, I then pretended that you know I'd been, <laughs> this was music I'd written weeks before and uh, and we ran through it with, with the band and, you know, they would put their ideas into it and their thoughts into it and we would develop that uh, alongside the music we had rehearsed the day before and the day before that. It started in Bermondsey in the Rolling Stones rehearsal room. Uh, uh, many incidents happened, um, some crazy, but uh, certainly the journey from where I lived and uh, near where Barry lived uh, in Putney, around the South Circle, it was a nightmare. We did this every morning in rush hour, so we were sort of commuters. <laughs> get to Bermondsey, sort of quite uh, sort of nitty gritty area. Um, the studio was, you wouldn't know it was there in the, in the basement of one of the buildings. Uh, no windows, but quite a big area and we had all our gear, everything was set up, everything we owned equipment wise was down in that basement. Uh, and literally we went there every day many many days a month two months i can't even remember but uh, we slowly put together pieces of music that would become a complete album thick as a brick Ian is playing a rhythmic link sequence consisting of alternating bars of c minor suspended chord and f major this quiet and very pleasant interlude precedes an entry by john's organ which then unites with the guitar to provide a textural overlay, rich in percussive counter rhythm. I see you jumping in the court's room, put your rings upon your fingers, and you found a little side of this, and your silver back of sheep. I'm playing at the hard case, you follow the example, but now the tonic paper I Jolly Japes down in that uh, basement uh, playing tricks on each other, uh, most of which I can't remember or I, I refu refuse to tell you.
It built up sequentially, day by day. It started at the beginning, and every day we added another bit of music. Sometimes it would maybe reprise one of the earlier ideas in some way, so we'd go back and kind of rework an earlier thought. Um, and uh, basically by the end of, I think, about two weeks, we, we had the whole thing rehearsed beginning to end. This was, a t this was a period of time of Monty Python's Flying Circus and, the, and, and a very British kind of a humour, which um, was not terribly well understood by the Japanese or the Americans when we finally went out to perform Thick as a Brick in Concert. But they, they sat politely, if uh, a little confused, through, <laughs> through the whole thing and came back next time for more, so it can't have gone too far amiss. From the beginning, we planned to do that these these uh, little scenarios w w w uh, within the show, I think probably we, we planned it in the rehearsal stage, so it was very very silly, uh, and the sillier it was, the better. All I remember is is me and Barry disappearing into a tent. I don't remember that for at a few all. minutes. Yeah, sure. there was a tent on stage, and me and Barry mm. disappeared into it, and they'd be sort of, you know, poking about inside the tent that you could obviously see. This is while something else is going on. Well, and I think things, things didn't last necessarily for very long. I mean, that no. might have just happened for a couple yeah. of nights, and then it was a rapidly changing process went on over the course of, I mean, more than one tour, I think. You know, I mean, it, it sort of but then, there are also set pieces because yes, of, there, were. there was the gorilla. Some things that stuck and were, yeah. were very good and were kept. The gorilla the came out with a camera and took That's photographs right. of the audience. The telephone ringing. That the kind telephone of ringing and, and Mike Nelson. John used to wear a rabbit suit, and um, he used to read the news out wearing this rabbit suit, and, and all these things that happened, you had to go and change very quickly behind the amps while something else was going on. And, and John liked to have a little can of beer now and again. Um, he had to take a pee break during the show, and, and he, he used to pee in an empty beer can at the back of the stage, you know, careful not to let the audience see. And one night, because it was very dark backstage, Somebody had kicked the beer can over, and unfortunately it had gone into the rabbit suit's head. And there's this terrible cry of anguish from behind the apps as John put his rabbit head on and got uh, a little bit wet. The one time we emerged from the studio was at lunchtime, and we'd go to Rose's Cafe along the road. Um, this is a very dubious establishment with um, the wi you could never see in it the windows were always completely steamed up from the fryers frying chips eggs bacon sausage everything that was really really bad for you and we would eat these massive lunches of pure unhealth um, and that would be our lunch break and then back in the studio again uh, to work many, many hours. It didn't make any difference because it, we couldn't tell if it was day or night.
It was done from memory, I think, perhaps in about you know eight to ten days of, of recording, which was really quite quick. But we did have it all rehearsed as a band, so we all knew our parts, theoretically. Finally, we, we were ready to go into the studio, into Morgan Studios, uh, with Robin Black producing, uh, and, and literally we put on a reel of two-inch tape, started recording at the beginning of Thick as a Brick, as you would hear it today, uh, record a piece of music, be happy with it, go home next day, put the same reel of tape on, where that last one stopped, we'd start again with, with the next piece of music. It was all sequential. Uh, and the, the only options we had was to get the, the next bit um, that was the performance we were all happy with. I think that went very well. It was, um, I mean, some of them were first takes, quite a few of them, weren't they? Some sections to be the beginning, I remember, backing tracks going very well. Uh, and the sessions were long and uh, we worked really, really hard and... I think they, I remember them getting later and later in the night and certainly have memories of uh, having to stop and have a break, having started at maybe six o'clock at night to go outside and discover it was morning and think, I think it's time to go home and sleep again. So we had this sort of crazy uh, 24 hour schedule uh, that that changed all the time. but. Essentially, we, we did that album from beginning to end on two reels of tape. Uh, it, it, it was recorded as it was conceived. And Good evening, this is the BBC News. And now the latest about thick as a brick. A hastily reconvened panel of judges accepted the decision by four leading child psychiatrists that the mind of little Milton Bostock was seriously unbalanced and that his work was a product of an extremely unwholesome attitude towards life, his God and country. Little Milton has been recommended for psychiatric treatment and Thick as a Brick has been turned into a 45-minute non-stop musical composition by the brilliant Ian Anderson and Jethro Tull. sleeve is a review of the record credited to Julian Stonemason BA, but which Ian admits to having written himself and which is not entirely uncritical. The paper also includes all the features one might expect in a local newspaper from advertisements and a crossword to sports reports and births, marriages and deaths. It, w it was decided pretty early on because we had um, in Chrysalis Records back then um, I'm not sure whether he was an A&R man, but he was relatively new to the scene. He had been a journalist for Sounds, uh, a musical newspaper in the UK at the time, um, Royston Eldridge, who later went on to be the managing director of Chrysalis Records until relatively recently. And um, Roy, having a background in the journalistic trade, um, was uh, given the job, whether he liked it or not, of putting together all of the, the ideas and the photographs for the newspaper into something that would resemble a really parochial little, you know, small town newspaper, such as the one I think he'd done his training on as a as a, a boy journalist. So um, Roy had to put it all together and edit it and check everything, and uh, and the ideas predominantly were mine, Geoffrey Hammonds, and John Evans, who had 
Um, I, John, I'm pretty sure, wrote you know a couple of pieces for it, but the rest of it was pretty much me and Jeffrey, I think, e equally really, with Roy tying it all together and um, putting everything into the column inches that would make sense. I, I would say that that uh, some people put a lot more to it than others, uh, but in 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 as as a whole, we all had something to add to it. So certainly, mine was a lesser amount, uh, and I would say Ian and Jeffrey were the sort of main contenders. Sort of the sort of zany humour that they shared uh, went into the putting together that cover so, but it, it was a, 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 a lot again a, a big project and again it was perhaps the mood of the times the the beginnings of Monty Python's success in the USA for example the, the Americans were just beginning to cotton on to this rather surreal and absurd and quite often challenging humor It's all experimental, but I think the audience of Jethro Tull likes that aspect that they, they, they never really knew what was going to happen next. That variety in what we did uh, made it work. By the standards of a, a U2 concert or a Michael Jackson concert or a Madonna concert, it would be incredibly tame theatrically. But by the standards of back then, it must have it must have been you know, quite a, an unusual thing, and quite a a lot of effort would appear to have gone into it, and a lot of detail would have uh, communicated itself to the audience if they were um, in the right mood. I, I, I thought we steered a very good line between making it sound um, vaguely plausible as a as a concept and being so, you know, quite um, quite silly um, to the extent that most people would get it and not be offended if they weren't quite sure. And somebody said, "Oh, come on, just putting you up." certainly six is a big, but by the time we got to Songs from the Wood and Heavy Horses and Stormwatch, his voice was at it. It was just incredible. What, no, what I must say and disclose is this, that I moved in and out of the lives of Jethro Tull, it's the members of the band. Periodically, I would go and come back again, and then go and come back again. So I saw Changes, personality changes in some of the some of the members, attitudinal changes, and certainly musical changes. When I heard Thick as a Brick for the first time, it was in Terry Alice's house in Bishop's Avenue. And I was with Maggie and we'd gone for dinner and he said, this is the new Tull album. And he played it to me. There were no vocals on there. He played it to me and I said, oh, I'd like to do an orchestral version of this. He said, is that the way you see it? And I said, well, yes, I mean, it's, there's a lot of repetition at the beginning, which I presume is, is covered by an interesting set of lyrics which Ian will come up with, a narrative. It, it's, it doesn't matter that, that it's... That, that that system is repeated so many times. That I'm sure the lyric and the story that will unfold will be good, but the, the, it, it just had an orchestral appeal to me, which Terry said, well, we'll think about that. And then, of course, I became involved not that very deeply with Thick as a Brick. 
um, with some te string textures, which I, I kind of had come then, to, I hadn't been that long involved with the band, four years or something, I could see what I thought would have had a, a dimension that wasn't there. I've got to do something that actually lifts the song and I hope that that's what, what I did, did just that. If it's going to be real when you're doing it. Yeah, but uh, it's like, uh, I remember reading something that, that Jackie Stewart once wrote about having sort of heightened sensitivity, heightened awareness while he was actually racing, and I felt a lot of sympathy with that because I feel more or less the same uh, on stage. Do you, do you regard it as a simple piece of work on top? Oh, I do, yeah. I mean, I play bits from it, and I think they're fantastic, you know, even playing a 20-minute segment. Um, it, it's, it's exciting, it's, it's really great music, and, and it works just as well now as it did, whatever, 40 years ago. It hasn't aged, and I don't think it ever will, because it's, it's so different. You, you can't put a tag on it. 
you can't say, oh, that's music from the 70s, I can tell by the sound of it. Um, and it's still challenging to play and uh, it, it, it's still fun to play. Welcome to another evening's light entertainment with Tom. Yeah. Now,